All right. According to YouTube, we are live. Uh, please put your name in the chat and let me know if you are here and you can hear me. Can you guys hear me? Let me know if you can hear me, okay, friends? Drop your name in the chat so I know who's with us tonight. All right, so it is 8 p.m., so we are gonna get started right on time. So let me show you what's going on tonight. Um, this is night number three of our live lesson on YouTube. And so the first night we met together, we worked on block number one. And so this was our block. The second night we met together, we made this block and this was block number two. Yours should have had a dark center if that's how you made your block. Um, so that is what we've been doing. So tonight is night three and let's see who we have live out there. So we have Lorraine Short and she can hear me. Thanks Lorraine. And then I have Julie from Ohio. Hi, Julie. We were busy yesterday. I spent uh, most of the day sewing. Anita is here from South Carolina. Welcome, Anita. And so the Jelly Roll Club, what is the Jelly Roll Club? It is a bunch of friends who get together and we work on projects that we pick together. So if you are new to the Jelly Roll Club, please don't forget to like our Facebook page so that you can pitch in and tell us what you want to sew with our group. So the Jelly Roll Club started five years ago and we met in person and we've been meeting in person every single year making projects together. But the pandemic forced us all to stay home and so now we're doing Jelly Roll both in person and uh, online. So if you are from another place, another state, you are welcome to join us whenever you want to. We have Zooms on Saturday and we also have Zoom classes. So if you don't know about what's going on, all you have to do is sign up for our mailing list and we will send you that information or you can go to the Facebook page because we always announce stuff that's happening there. Okay, see, so I have uh, Joy from Canada, Anita and Ohio. So we have people from all over the place. All right, what's our block tonight? Our block is our double whirly gig. And so this has like a pinwheel in the middle and then this thing that looks like a kid's whirly gig. So Ellie Grimes from Nicholasville, hi Ellie. Um, and so this is what we're gonna work on tonight. So the first thing that I want you to do is I want you to take a little bit of time um, to tell me about your first time that you ever bought a jelly roll. And hi, Bettina, how's it going? The very first time that I bought a jelly roll was in 2012, because before that I always bought fat quarters like most quilters, but I didn't know what to do with my jelly rolls. So I bought my jelly rolls and I just started kind of picking them up because they looked pretty, because a jelly roll when it's first in its package looks like a big giant ball of candy. And so I didn't know what to do with my jelly rolls, so I just kept buying them and stacking them up in my sewing room. And then I decided that I was going to figure out how to use all of those little pieces of joy. And I started finding patterns that would work with my jelly rolls. Jelly rolls are great for small blocks. So for example, if you're doing farm girl vintage, all of these little blocks like this, like the little uh, jam jars or blocks like this, a little churn dash or a shoe fly. Even things like this, like this little acorn, all are used, all are made with jelly rolls. So these are all jelly roll strips that make these. And even this little scrappy strings block with leftover pieces, all of these are jelly roll pieces. So I have learned that jelly rolls are extremely flexible. You can even make this cute little chicken with a jelly roll. So I love jelly rolls and I love small blocks. So if you love to make things that are cute and fun, jelly rolls are the way to go. All right, so let's get started tonight. So I have uh, Julie and I have Anita and Joy and Ellie and Betty tonight. So let's get started. Oh, Bettina, I'm sorry. The first thing that we're gonna do is I'm gonna rotate my camera so we can work and you can see what's happening. So I have my pattern in front of me. And if you went to the website, you should have your pattern too. And I'm gonna move this stuff out of my way. So let's look at this pattern tonight. This pattern has uh, 
a couple of ways that you can make this pattern. So you could make this entire block using half square triangles, or you can make this block in segments. Tonight, I'm gonna to show you how to make this block using half square triangles, because that's the most simple way for a beginning quilter to make this project. If we wanted to, I could take, and I could block this out, and we could actually cut a four and a half inch rectangle and then put two easy corners on there. But that produces a lot of waste and I don't like to. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the normal method and I'm just gonna draw a grid with a Sharpie on my pattern to show me where all my half square triangles go. And I'm gonna just draw these lines. I found a nice brand new Sharpie today. And I'm gonna break my block down. And I'm not afraid to get Sharpie marker on my ruler because if I do, I can use a little uh, bit of rubbing alcohol and get that right off of my ruler. So I'm gonna rotate my block now. And so now I have this in four rows, one direction, and I'm gonna draw a line four rows the other direction. And just like that, I have a block that breaks down into a bunch of little half square triangles. And so again, for this block, you're gonna need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So you're gonna need 12 of this particular block. So I need 12 of this half square triangle that goes right here. I need four of this one. And so this block can be done with just a uh, a partial strip and a whole strip. To make four of these, you're gonna need a piece of jelly roll strip that is 11 inches wide. So you don't have to use an entire strip, just cut one that's about 11 inches wide, and then you're gonna sew that a quarter of an inch on either side so you can take one of these background pieces and you're just gonna cut it 11 inches you're gonna lay two of them together. You're gonna to cut it 11 inches, and then you're gonna put these right sides together and sew a quarter of an inch on either side, making that little tube like we've made before. I already have one that's been sewn. So if you look at mine, how these tubes lay together, and these are still together, is like this, because this is how we get all of those little pieces. And so this is what my strip looked like before I cut it up. And so I had my strip and I just did that 45 degree that I do with my square little ruler. So I take my ruler, I cut a, I cut a 45 on one end and then I make my way around until I get my four pieces. So if you will go ahead and cut your first uh, set. Hi, Carolyn, how's it going? I have uh, Malia. Hi, Malia, and I have Chris out there. Welcome to the Jelly Roll Club. So I'm gonna go ahead and rotate my camera and you let me know when you're ready to go and you have sewn an 11 inch piece to make these four centers. And I'm gonna take, and I'm gonna make it in a different colorway. So you're just gonna take one Jelly Roll strip of your choice. It doesn't matter which one. I'm gonna pick this nice purple with flowers. This is uh, from Marcus Fabrics. This is a 1930s reproduction line. I love those, they're my favorite. And I'm gonna cut an 11 inch piece and get those ready for sewing. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna add one of these background pieces. Don't worry if it's not pressed, you're gonna press it in a minute. And then I'm just gonna line it up right on my uh, cutting mat and I'm gonna snip a piece that's 11 inches. You don't have to worry about being super precise. So if it's a little over 11, it doesn't matter as long as it's at least 11 inches. And so now that it's 11, I'm gonna make sure that those are even and I'm gonna go sew one fourth of an inch on either side. And I want you to do the same thing because this is a sew along, okay? 
So you're sewing and I'm sewing and we're sewing together. So let me go over here. I'm going to put my right sides together. And I'm going to sew a quarter of an inch on either side of this little strip right here. Okay, one of the things that I want you to tell me is what is your favorite type of jelly roll? Do you like florals? Do you like petites? What kind of jelly rolls do you collect? And you can drop that in the chat if you want to tell me what kind of jelly rolls you collect. I tend to collect jelly rolls that have fabrics that are reproduction fabrics. So I get a lot of 1930s reproduction fabrics. Uh, I like Civil War fabrics, but I also like neon bright glow in the dark petites. Anything that catches your eye. I love things that um, have little dainty flowers. And maybe that's because I raised two daughters. And so my favorite type of jelly rolls, look at this box. Nothing but cutesy little florals and little dots. Those are my favorite things. So those are the things that I love the most. Okay. So how's it going? Carolyn, you like bright colors too? I do too. I like things that are cheerful. When I look at a jelly roll, it should scream happy. And so those are some of my favorite things. If they scream happy, then I'm okay. There's nothing wrong with liking dark colors. It's just not what I like. So each person is different. All right, I'm going to rotate down and I'm going to zoom in on my hands so that you guys can watch me cut that strip. So if you're new... Yes, cheerful is good. So if you are new and you've never done this before, I'm going to show you how to turn this tube of fabric because I have sewn on both sides, quarter of an inch on either side. I'm going to show you how to turn that into um, a set of half square triangles. So let's look at that. You always start on one end and you can do this several ways. You could use your board and use the 45 inch line right here and just line it up this way and cut across. So if you line that up with a 45 inch line and this one is it right here, see how the line sticks out on this side and the line sticks out on this side? If I wanted to, I could literally just line that up carefully along this bottom line so that it's straight and putting this very tip on the 45 line and then allowing myself to simply lay a little ruler across there and take my first cut. So that's one way of doing it. And that's for people who don't have squares, but this one is the easiest way. So what I do is I take my, my strip, I start on this side and I'm going to line up that middle line, which is my 45. So if you take it and it's like this, and you rotate it so that that uh, middle line that goes through this ruler goes right on top of that stitching. I'm gonna line this up from corner to stitch line. And once it's lined up from corner to stitch line, then I can take my first cut. And so how I do this is I just go backwards just a hair, and then I go straight across. And what that gives me is that perfect first cut. And I'm saving all of these because these turn into cute little blocks that you can make quarter square triangles. And so I'm gonna save those and make a mug rug when I'm done with this project. So I'm saving all of those. All right, so then you have your second cut. And today you're not gonna see my stitch line. When we did this a couple of weeks ago, I used gray thread, but I'm not using gray thread today, I'm using ivory. So once you get that first cut, doesn't matter which side you go on, you're gonna take that ruler that I used right here and you're simply gonna slide it to the other side and you're not lining it up with any of the numbers, you are simply 
trying to make sure that the side of that ruler is touching the stitches up here and that you're lining up that center line. You can line that up with the bottom. And so I'm going to push it. I don't know if you can see that. Let me zoom in so you can see my hands. That line is right against the bottom right here. And then I'm sliding it until this edge touches my stitching right here. And then I'm going to make my second cut. And once I have that, I have a nice, big, generous half square triangle that I can press and square up so that it's perfect. And that's how you make perfect half square triangles. So I'm going to do that and finish that up. And I will save these because I will use these in my next block. So every time I model for you guys, I save those. And so there it is. I'm lining that with the bottom. And then I'm sliding that up until I reach my stitch line on the other side. So once I reach my stitch line, so it's lined up with the bottom, and that is touching my stitching line right up there. Now I can make the next cut. And let's talk about rotary cutting. The most important thing about rotary cutting is trying not to cut too many layers at the same time and using a sharp blade. There's nothing more dangerous than a dull blade. The other thing is, is you should always cut away from yourself. And if you can get a hold of an inexpensive mat like this one, I got this one at the Dollar Tree for $1. Yes, you heard that correctly. I got this for $1. And then you can also find things like this, like a little mat. It allows you to trim those tiny pieces without having to spend money on a big, expensive, rotating mat. Uh, Lori loves Lori Holt fabric. I do too. I love Lori Holt fabric. All right, so let's keep cutting. Okay, friends, I'm going to go back down here so you guys can see. If you guys have a little mat like this, it makes it easy when you start um, laying those on there and trimming them up. So let's get this uh, cut. And then we will have our little half square triangles and we can continue. So I will do this to my entire strip and then I'm going to do that again to my second strip, which is going to go on here. And it's going to be this nice, cute uh, Lori Holt. This one's from the B Basics line. And so this is going to be my next one because this is going to require 12 half square triangles of this aqua color. So I'm using this one and then I'm using this uh, Lori Holt in the middle. And don't be afraid to mix and match for more than one jelly roll. If you buy uh, the same kinds of fabric from, from the same designer, like I love Bonnie and Camille, and so as long as you stick with the same uh, Moda designers or Robert Kaufman, you're going to find that a lot of the jelly rolls will mix and match so that if you don't have enough of one jelly roll, you don't have to worry about it because you can save uh, one jelly roll and mix and match with a second jelly roll. And that's okay. They don't have to be the same. All right. So how's everybody doing? You guys doing okay so far? This is going to be so easy. When you guys are done making this summer sampler, you're going to you're going to think this is nothing and you're going to do this all the time. You'll be able to make hundreds of blocks. Um, for those of you who have never been with us before, we have been working on the double wedding ring. So if you notice behind me, I finished my double wedding ring table runner. I was so excited. So I'm going to grab this and show it to you guys. This uh, table runner is made with templates and jelly roll strips left over from my little ruby line by Moda. I love uh, Bonnie and Camille. And so this is one of my fabrics. So I'm done with this table runner. So if you guys are gonna join us for free motion quilting on the 20th, this is the table runner that I'm going to be quilting. So I'm so excited about that. I can't wait till we get together for free motion quilting next week. I love bright and cheerful. And so that's what we're working on. So, okay. So now that I've got that, I have two sets of jelly roll strips ready to go. I'm gonna do 
my blue one. And since I need 12, and I know that I can get at least 16 out of here, I think I'm going to go ahead and do the entire strip uh, and cut what I need and then save the rest for another one of my blocks. If you notice, there's bonus blocks. If you go to the website, there's a link at the bottom that shows you 25 different blocks that you can make with half square triangles so that if you don't like some of the blocks that you see on a given week, you're like, eh, I'm not crazy about that. I don't feel like making a house or a log cabin. You could just go there and pick one of those blocks and all you have to do is use all of your little leftovers and you can build all of those blocks that are on there. So that's a way to use all of your scraps so that you're not wasting anything. I cannot stand uh, wasteful sewing. So I'm going to take my last one. And I hope you're doing the same thing. And I'm going to go ahead and sew this on both sides. And let me know when you guys are ready to move on. And I'll show you what to do next. Okay. The purpose of these uh, Sunday sew-alongs is so that when we are done, you are done with your block. There's nothing more tragic than to go to a, a class and the teacher goes 100 miles an hour and then you go home and you don't know what to do and you end up with another UFO pile in your sewing line. My goal is for you to have no UFOs and for you to finish every single block that you start. And my sewing machine is gone. Let's talk about sewing machines. I'm a sewing machine addict, I have to confess. I've been clearing out all of my things and cleaning up because I had to move my sewing room to the basement. And so I packed up everything that was in my sewing room upstairs. And what I discovered is I have more sewing machines than I really need. I have a total of eight sewing machines. And most of my sewing machines are good old fashioned vintage sewing machines. But my favorite of all the machines I have is this guy right here. It's a Brother PQ1500. And the reason I like this machine is because it sews really, really, really fast. And so more than anything, I like speed. Okay. After you're done sewing, and I sew up one side and down the other, that prevents your uh, strip from being warped. Then I take a little piece of fabric and I stick it under my presser foot and I sew on it before I cut it off. Why do I do that? Well, I don't have to pull a big string of thread to snip or use my thread cutter. And so there's a lot less waste with your thread. You can never have too many sewing machines. That is correct. Um, but I have a total of eight sewing machines. I love my friends. They all have names. This one has a label on there, and her name is Bertha. And Bertha is the birth mother of all of my quilts. So if you ever talk to me, um, I talk about Bertha, my best friend. She is my girlfriend, my hangout buddy. She helps me do all of the things that I want to do. I also have... Uh, Gertrude. Gertrude is a treadle machine from the 1930s. I love Gertie. Um, she still works. I found her at an estate sale and she was a wedding gift. And uh, the lady who passed away uh, when they liquidated her estate, I got a hold of Gertie. And so she had only had one owner when she was 75. Um, at this point, Gertie is 91. And I have used Gertie to make several quilts. I love Gertie. 
All right. What kind of thread do I use? Okay. While you are sewing, I'm going to stop really quick and talk about thread. Okay. I use uh, two types of thread and most of you are familiar with Orophil. So that's one of my favorite threads. I love Orophil for piecing. This is my piecing thread. And then I like to use Guterman uh, thread. So I use 100% cotton thread. These are the colors that you're going to see in my sewing room. I get black and white. I like these bigger spools. I get uh, gray in this medium gray and a lighter gray. I get taupe and then I buy any pastel that's on sale. So if you can uh, find it on sale, which I like to do, sometimes you get them on clearance, 50% off. Um, I get a pale pink, a pale peach, a pale blue. You can use pastel threads as long as you shorten your stitch length. So if you use a really short stitch length, like 2.0 instead of 2.5, when you use um, thread, then you won't even notice that you're using a different color thread. The threads that you use for quilting should be a 50 weight. And so look for that number that says 50. They're always somewhere on there. So this one says Orophil and it's Mako. And this is a 50 weight thread as well. And if you look on this one, this one is a 50 weight thread. And this one is a 50 weight thread. And if you can see that, I don't know if it's going to zoom in, but that's a 50 weight thread. When you use a 50 weight thread, you have to use the needle that goes with it. And the needles that I use for piecing are these needles right here. So these are my favorite needles. The sharper, the better. I never, ever use a universal needle in my sewing machine anymore because... I'm quilting and so and piecing. So what I use are the sharpest needle possible. And so this one is called an embroidery. It's like a gold tip. It's a 7511. If you use a 50 weight thread like this, then you need a needle. The eye of the needle should be 40% bigger than your thread. That means you're going to use an 8012 or a 7511. The bigger the number, so if you have a 19 right here, that means the thicker the thread. So if I use a 19 for a 90, 14, that is a great big thick needle, and I don't want that. So I use like a mid size needle, a 7511 or an 8012, and I always use a, either a Microtex, which is really, really sharp. Um, I change my needles often, or I use a top stitch needle, and it says top stitch, or if I can find a quilting needle, I use a quilting needle. This one is an embroidery needle, so it has a big eye, and these are great for metallic threads. So that's the kind of thread and needles that I use in my machine. Change your needles often. That causes skip stitches, and it'll cause problems in your project if you don't switch out your needle. I switch out my needle um, every um, six bobbins. So when I sew, I keep, I wind like six bobbins. I will sew six bobbins. I clean the lint out of my machine and I switch my needle and I add a few drops of oil and that keeps my machine in tip top shape. So that's your uh, needle and thread information. Also don't hoard too much thread because if you have too much thread, it can dry rot and then your project is for naught. So one of the things you can do to check is you can roll it around your fingers and if you give it a little tug and it doesn't break easily, then that thread is still in good shape. So that's one of the things I do, I check my thread. So I try not to have more than about six spools of thread at any one time. Um, so if I can't use them in, in like 18 months or two years, then I'm not gonna keep them because your thread will rot, especially your cotton thread. And that's a bad thing. Rotten thread is a bad, bad thing. And so that was a great question, Carolyn, is what thread do I use? So that is your answer. Anybody else have quilting questions you want to ask me? You can ask me anything you want. And while I'm sitting here cutting my half square triangles, I will be happy to answer them. Jelly roll math is one that I get asked a lot. How much is in a jelly roll? One jelly roll equals 2.75 yards. 
That's why if you cannot find a jelly roll you like, buy yardages. Quarter yard um, is a great way to make several jelly roll strips. You can even use fat quarters to make jelly roll strips. You get seven half strips out of a fat quarter. So if you go to your quilt shop and you don't see a jelly roll that you like, don't panic because you can cut your own jelly rolls. And I do it all the time. It saves money. It saves money. If you can find uh, fabric on sale, by all means, get your fabric on sale. All right. I'm almost done cutting my half square triangles. There we go. Let's see, I've got nine people out, 19 people out there with me. So who is there? Oh, strip tube ruler. Yes, good question. I have a ruler that can be used for squaring up your blocks. And so if you have a companion angle or a strip tube ruler, those are great for uh, trimming these little squares to perfection. So let me see where mine's at. Okay, so I have this ruler and this one is called the companion angle. I also have one that's called the strip tuber. And if you notice, this ruler has little numbers on it that say one, one and a half, two, two and a half. That's the line on which you line up your little square on the bottom like this to trim these. Um, you've seen probably the lady named Jenny Doan. She uses that perfectly slotted trimmer. You can do this with other things. So for example, if I line this up with that line and I give them a little trim, I line that up across the bottom, then I can trim that on two sides and that'll give me a perfect half square triangle. And so you can always do that. And so check your number and measure yours on my ruler. This one looks like it may be the number that I need right here. Let me open this first and measure. So I'm going to pinch that across and I'm going to see where that line is so that I can get a two and a half inch square. And it looks like, it's my little tiny square ruler. And it looks like for a two and a half inch square on this ruler, I have to line it up with this line that's across the three. And so I can take a, a little piece of tape. I can take my Sharpie marker and mark it across here. So in order for me, and I can circle that, in order for me to make a two and a half inch square, I'm going to have to line it up with that number three line. And you can check it using a two and a half inch ruler. So I'm going to lay that down again. And so this is this dashed line. That dashed line has to sit on my stitch line. And so I'm going to lay it like this and I'm going to lay that stitching right on my stitch line right there. And I'm just going to take it and give it a little trim on one side. And when I do, that should measure two and a half inches. And I always chop my doggy ears off. So if you chop your doggy ears off, these lay better. And so now when I press this open and I press it to the dark side, I should be able to lay my ruler on there and it measures two and a half inches and it does. So if you have a ruler like this, it can save you time in your trimming. So if you have like a companion angle, love this little guy, um, you can make half square triangles in all kinds of sizes. So as you can see, it makes great big half square triangles. And you can also use this to cut your, your little uh, triangles as well. So, Anita, that was a great question. It was a great question, Anita. So, you can use a tool like the companion angle, and it makes this job a lot faster. Because I could take, actually, two at a time, if I really wanted to, and lay those stitch line to stitch line. Just like that. Stitch line to stitch line. I could lay that companion angle right on top. Yes, you can also use those to cut your triangles. And so I'm going to lay that with that number three line right on my stitching line right here, just like that. And now I can take this and I'm going to come up this side and I'm going to come down this side and be careful always when cutting towards you. It's dangerous. I try never to cut towards me. I try to always cut away from myself. 
When you do that, you're gonna get this little piece that's now two and a half inches. And I trim my bunny ears carefully with my scissors. And now I have two more that are two and a half inches square. And so, yeah, if you have this one, you can do the same thing. But if you don't, don't panic. You can do the same thing with a little tiny ruler and then you can square them up with a little one. You can even square them up with this one. So don't feel like you have to have a dozen rulers. I have them because I'm a ruler addict, but you don't have to have dozens of rulers to do this job. So you'd use what you have on hand because the goal of quilting is not to bankrupt you, but for you to have fun. And nobody's, nobody's having fun when they're broke, right? Yes, you can absolutely use those. Does anybody else have any questions about what we're going to do? And yes, you can use this right here. I lay that on the stitching line right there, and I could use that to cut my triangles. Just like that. So if I really wanted to, I could use this ruler, lining it up with that stitch line across that three right there. And then these don't even have to be trimmed, but you have to be careful because sometimes you get weird little weird little shapes on the end, like this one has a weird little shape if your quarter inch line is not perfect. I like to do them just a tiny bit bigger to give myself some insurance so that I can square them up after I press them because sometimes blocks do get a little distorted when you press. That's just the nature of the beast. Anytime you're pushing against that cotton fabric, it can distort it a little. And so this is what I'm doing. I'm just flip-flopping that ruler back and forth, laying it against that stitch line and pulling it forward so that mine have less trimming to do. All right, friends, how are you guys doing out there in sewing land? He is getting it done. Let's count. I've lost track now. One, two, three. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I needed 12. So I'm going to go ahead and cut the rest of those with my ruler. And like I said, mine are, I'm, I'm lining them up a tiny bit bigger because I do like to go ahead and square mine up. I'm not a fan of cutting them just the same size and then pressing them because then what happens is that sometimes they can get distorted and look a little wonky. And I really like for my half square triangles to match up perfectly. Did you see what I did right there? I actually uh, made it a little too big and it had a little piece of thread. You can just pop that. Doesn't matter. It's oversized. So open that, pop that like a little present and it'll be fine. I can still use that. All right. So now I'm going to go ahead and press all of these little guys. And now I have a little farm of half square triangles. I'm gonna get them all pressed really quick. All right. How's it going out there, friends? You hanging in there? How about daylight savings time? Who's a fan of daylight savings time? I am because as soon as daylight savings time happens, we get longer evenings and there's nothing more delightful than sitting outside and uh, spending time outdoors. I love spring. I love fall. Um, I don't like uh, the heat of summer because I don't like feeling like I'm on Hill's front porch and my hair's melting. So I prefer fall and spring. That's also what most of my quilts look like. So most of my quilts either look like fall or spring. So my quilts are either in bright springy colors or I like to make deep fall jewel tones like oranges and dark greens and purples. But most of my quilts reflect uh, my favorite things. So here I am pressing away. I only use the most inexpensive irons that you can get like at Walmart, at Family Dollar, do you see that? It's like a Proctor Silex and I never add water. So then my iron doesn't end up all scuzzy and dirty. And when I press, this is super lightweight so that I'm not distorting my blocks. And I do not use water in my iron. I do not use water. And I also do not use Best Press 
or starch when I'm quilting. There's already uh, a lot of sizing in most fabric, especially um, jelly roll strips. If you feel them, they, they feel kind of stiff to me. And so adding too much starch makes it really hard when you're pressing your quilts or when you're trying to match points. So I try not to over starch uh, my fabric. I actually only do it uh, when I'm done with my blocks. So once I'm done and I like my blocks and they look really nice, then I will spritz them with a little bit of fabric sizing and make them crisp just a little because that helps with the machine quilting aspect. Now my backs, I will use um, a little bit of fabric sizing on my backs if I'm machine quilting because that makes them slide around better. Oh, the background quilt. The background quilt that you see was a wedding gift um, that I got. Um, it was made by my husband's grandmother. She made this quilt um, in the late 1960s and it is called Jacob's Ladder. But what she did is that she changed the color placement on there. And so it made the, the pattern run vertical instead of the traditional horizontal. But that is simply a Jacob's Ladder. Uh, quilt back there and that was made by my husband's granny and it's one of my favorite quilts in the whole wide world So I will be making a, a reproduction of that quilt using solids I love the bright colors that she included some of the purples are starting to fade But I love that quilt and I usually keep it out of the Sun and I don't let cats or dogs touch it um, and I don't let children jump all over it. So that's just a snuggle blanket that we use that was made by Granny. So we love that quilt. Feel free to ask any question you want about any quilt topic. I'll be glad to answer it. I'll be glad to research it. And if you have projects that you want us to do, go ahead and drop those in the suggestion box because I get all of my ideas from the people in the Jelly Roll Club and then I turn around and I either write the patterns using electric quilt or I find patterns that we can use as a, a group. So you just tell me what you wanna make and then I start planning. So in the future, we have a jelly roll class and we have a free motion class because that's what club members voted for. So you just tell me what you wanna make and I will work on that. So we've got in June, as soon as we're done with double wedding ring, because double wedding ring should wrap up in May. So in June, we're going to have a class in uh, how to make uh, postcards from Sweden. That one is not a jelly roll project, but that's one of the projects that's been on my bucket list. And I've had the fabric um, saved up. I've also made that before in a small scale. So I made like a baby size quilt using that pattern, but I wanted to make uh, what's on my bucket list is a ginormous one with humongous half square triangles. So that's what I'm doing next. So how many projects do you have in progress? That's always a question that I, I want to know about other quilters because I'm always planning at least three or four projects at one time. I don't know about you, but I love having several projects going at the same time because if I get tired of making the same block, I can just switch to another one. So I have right now a total of seven quilt projects that I'm working on. I finish them all in the summer usually because I teach during the school year. But in the summertime, I work like the Dickens, especially in June and July, and I get a whole pile of quilts done in the summertime. What about you? How many projects are you working on right now? And you're gonna see a different quilt behind me each time that we meet. So last week I had a basket quilt back there last time I think, and that one is one that I made strictly out of jelly roll strips, the whole thing. This one is Granny Foster's quilt but I will put a quilt behind me every single time. So Car Carol, you have five. What are you working on, Carol? <laughs> Four UFOs. 
I think that this year, uh, some of the members of the Jelly Roll Club that met in person, so we had uh, Pam and Joyce, and I think it was Betty Ann. There were several of us that, that ate lunch, and I think we're going to plan a uh, retreat to complete. That would be nice and fun. So as soon as we're allowed to go meet somewhere, we're going to do a, a retreat to complete. And that's where you do nothing but bring your UFOs and you work on them. We also do that on Saturday nights. So if you want to do that, we get on Zoom and we just chatter away and we Zoom together and we build our um, our quilt projects. Okay, so how's it going? Let me see what you got so far. I've got my little pile of uh, quilters candy here, all these little half square triangles and I'm gonna go ahead and press, press, press to my heart's content. I'm gonna check them all. If you want to cheat on squaring them up, I'm going to show you another little um, trick that you can use. Once you get them pressed, um, and that one is an end, so that one's not actual a block, and you take your two and a half inch little square that you have, if you lay that right on the stitch line like this, just on this side of the stitch line, so that that line hits just grazing that stitch line. Do you see where I have two bits on either side? I can take and run my rotary cutter on both sides of that little uh, thing. And when I open that, that is a perfect, perfect little two and a half inch square. And so that's one way of making these. So when I press that open and I always press to the dark and to the side and I measure that, that is an exact two and a half inch square. So that's another way of using this little, this little block. <laughs> so Carolyn's working on You Are My Sunshine. I have that panel. I have that panel and so I'm going to have to work on that. And I just got another jelly roll this uh, yesterday, I bought it at my local quilt shop. They had it 70% off. I love to support my local quilt shop. And it is nothing but sunflowers to go with that You Are My Sunshine panel. So I'm pretty excited about that. So I will work on my sunshine quilt because I don't always do jelly roll projects. I do 99% of my projects are jelly roll projects. But sometimes I do projects that are not jelly rolls. Two point five inches, Chris. So look, I have a two point five inch ruler. So this is a little tiny square. If you have one of these in your quilt room, good for you. You're gonna lay that right on your stitch line, just where the, just where the the line right there down the middle goes, just barely below the stitch line, and then you're gonna take this, and you're gonna trim two sides off of it like this. And so then you're saving yourself a ton of work and that makes a perfect little tiny half square triangle that's two and a half inches. And so I trim those and I am ready to go. And just so you guys know, I'm in Georgetown, Kentucky. If you guys don't know anything about me and, and you're new, I am obsessed with quilting. And so this is what I do for fun. This is my hobby. So there you go. Perfect little half square triangles. I leave them laying on this wool mat because the heat um, from this mat radiates back up. Do not use water on these wool mats because it will. if you have it on another surface like this, it will totally warp your cutting mat. And so I use no water on mine. No water at all. And so I'm almost done. It won't take me any time at all. I'm going to double check these for size. And then you're probably wondering why I put this just below the stitching and not right on the stitching. Well, when you uh, fold this to the side, like this, you're gonna lose a tiny bit of fabric in this fold. And so by 
laying this line just a hair below that stitch line, it accounts for that. And so then your little square turns out extra perfect. And so if you lay that right there, here's another way of trimming these up. And like I said, don't be afraid to use a little mat like this. It makes it safer for you to take these. Lay that. This side doesn't have to be perfect. I'm going to lay that right on the stitch line. I'm going to trim up one side. And then just to be safe so I'm not cutting towards me, I can trim that. Turn that just a hair. Look at that. That has a wonky bottom because those two strips were not the same size. I'm going to trim that off. And now when I open it and snip these little dog ears, I have a perfect little half square triangle. Voila. And I love having my little half square triangle. So I'm going to keep sewing and I'm going to keep pressing. And I hope you will keep doing the same thing so we can get this block finished in no time flat. It is 8.50 and I think we could have this done by 9.30. So let's see. I love sewing on Sunday nights. It's uh, Sewing is my happy place. I always feel good after I sew. And that's one thing that I want to tell you. I've been sewing a long time and quilting too. Never beat yourself up because 90% of the people who get your quilt don't care that your quilt is not absolute perfection. What they care is that you spend a great deal of time working on this beautiful piece of work that you give them. So even if you are a new quilter and your quilt is not perfection, never panic. Besides, if they're that negative and they're that persnickety, maybe they don't need one of your beautiful quilts. I love making sure that my quilts are nice uh, and the points match, that they don't have great big mistakes in them. But I've been quilting a long time, and so my quilts tend to turn out um, pretty exact. How they turn out exact is consistency. Using a quarter inch uh, line on my sewing machine and just learning how to use some basic tools. So learning how thread, how thick thread works. The, the thickness of the thread impacts the size of your project because that seam, believe it or not, um, definitely changes. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm live on TV. What's that idea? Everybody, this is my granddaughter, Ella. And what's this? What's this? One second, what? friends. One second. What's this? Oh, my gosh. She just took down my, my thing. Okay. What is that? One second, friends. I'll be right back. Well, I'm back, friends. <laughs> that was my granddaughter. She usually spends the night at her other grandma's house on Sunday nights so that I can sew. But tonight she came early. <laughs> and so that's my design wall back there. So you have painter's canvas and 60% off. So Carol made herself a design wall. That behind me, what that quilt is on, is my design wall. I made it using PVC pipe. <laughs> I'm still laughing about that, people. I made it using PVC pipe and uh, a few elbows. It cost me maybe a total of $7 to make that design wall behind me. And it's the best little thing ever. So when I take that quilt down, I just have quilt batting wrapped around my PVC. 
and I can take and I can lay my blocks on there or pin them so I can see the, the layout of my blocks. So let me see what I've got here. So how's it going? Are you guys getting close on your half square triangles? Sorry for that intermission, friends. <laughs> Ella Bella is my first granddaughter. She's my only granddaughter. And she is the Hot Mess Express. She is a bundle of energy. So love having Miss Ella Bella in the house. All right, so here we go. Working away, working away. And we are gonna get this done. So this quilt will have a total of, uh, this lesson series, this quilt will have a total of 16 blocks, right? We have 12 lessons, but there's a total of 16 blocks if you wanna make this quilt in um, a straight layout. So if you wanna put this in rows, right? You're doing four across and four up and down. So four rows of four. And where you get those additional blocks are by looking on the website where it says optional. There's a whole bunch of optional blocks that you can make with all your leftovers. And that's where you get those two extra blocks. A 40 by 60 inch and then covered it with batting. I love having a design wall, friends. It is great for laying out a quilt, a whole quilt. The things that I love most that I use a lot in quilting is my uh, my wool pressing mat. You can actually save a bunch of money by buying a horse pad. There's a, there's a pads that go under a horse's saddle and you can get one that's like 30 inches. So instead of these little guys like this that are like 24, I think this one is like 18 inches long by 12. You can get great big giant ones that are like 24 by 30 that you can put on a like a folding table or iron a bigger quilt by getting them at uh, the tractor supply store or the, the place where you get supplies for your horses. And so those are also one inch just like these are and they're 100% wool. But yeah, if you see my quilt behind me, um, it is literally a PVC pipe, as you guys saw it fall. And underneath, I have a piece of batting. And so I pin my quilt pieces to that. And that's my portable sewing wall. And so I love having that. And then when I'm done, I just take all the pieces down and I put that, that back in a, in a closet. And I have my design wall that I can move no matter where I'm sewing because I sew. Um, wherever I want to. So sometimes I sew in my dining room. If I want to spread out on my ginormous dining room table, I get my leaves out because my table can, can reach 120 inches. So if I'm doing free motion quilting on a big quilt, I use my dining room table. And so when I'm in there, I use my design wall behind me to like lay out an entire quilt. I can lay it out on that table. I don't know about you, but I'm getting way too old to crawl on my hands and knees on the floor to lay out a quilt. And I used to do that when I was young, but not anymore. If your sewing space is small, think of the biggest space that you have. Most people's biggest space is their living room. For some people, it's their dining room is, is roomy. Maybe it's your kitchen counter. You sew wherever it is that you can spread out without people interrupting your quilt project. And so that's what I do. Um, in our house, we have a multi-generational family. So my daughter lives with me. My granddaughter lives with me. Um, so Mariah is my youngest and she lives with me and my oldest has her own house but we're a multi-generational family and so they're living here until they save money to get their own house because let's be uh let's be honest the economy is not the best and so people are trying to save money any way they can and so she's saving money by living here with us and uh trying to get enough money so that when they buy their house they're not drowning in debt Drowning in debt is like the worst thing ever. All right, so how's it going, friends? Are you getting close? I'm getting really close to mine. All 
All right. And this seems kind of tedious, and it is a little bit, but you know what? These blocks turn out so cute. I love how these blocks turn out. Like I said, I sketch my blocks a lot of times on graph paper. Um, if you have been quilting for a long time, somebody along the way probably taught you to sketch your quilt blocks along graph paper because that's how we used to do them. We used to draw them on graph paper, then add a quarter inch seam all the way around and then cut them out of template plastic. And then you would use a little sandy board and some template plastic and you would make your quilt pieces out of that. And you would trace them with a pencil. You would trace them with a pencil and then you would make your uh, blocks. And that's how I learned to quilt a long time ago. Thank goodness for rulers like this and rotary cutters and all of the things that we have now. I just feel uh, like I can work so much faster now that we have all these amazing tools. And so what used to take me months and months to make a quilt, maybe one quilt a year, I can now finish in just a few weeks. And so that makes me happy because I love to sew a lot. All right. All right, how's it coming? I've got most of my pieces here ready to go. And so today, in just a minute, I'm gonna show you a new technique, which is called block stringing. That's where you lay out an entire block, and this is why I'm spending more time today getting every piece ready, and then sewing little strings that don't uh, break up. So I have somebody, she says she's ready to sew. Is that Lorraine? Lorraine is ready to sew. If, if you are ready to sew, please let me know. And I will, I'm almost done so that we can get this done lickety split. I will show you block stringing, which is a technique that really helps you keep your blocks straight from getting all cattywampus and having to use Jack the Ripper, the seam ripper. So I'm almost done. I've got my little stack right here of little blocks. I've got just a couple more to cut. All right. Let me trim this little guy and we lay it down. And then I'm just going to count. There's nothing more tragic than not having enough pieces. And you're like, wait a minute, where's my pieces? I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven eight, nine. I just need a couple more. So I need three more for my little polka dotty fabric. I'm going to throw my extras to the side. I'm going to check these. These should be pretty exact because I use the strip tuber. That one is. And so I'm getting close. If you need to grab something to drink, grab something to drink. Take a little restroom break if you need to while I am getting the rest of these ready. And then we will be ready to move on to the next step. If you assembly line do these, you can get really, really fast. I've gotten to the point where I can make 16 half square triangles in literally like 15 minutes. When I'm working by myself and I'm just going really fast, I can sew like the wind and get them done. All right. So now we have all of our pieces cut and all of our pieces pressed. I'm gonna trim any weird little dog ears I have hanging out. 
those things make it hard to match up your seam. So always trim your dog ears because your dog ears can interfere with how well you match your seams. All right, so now we're ready to go. I have my pattern and I'm gonna lay my block out in its entirety now. So I'm gonna lay this one this way. So this is my row. So I have two going in like this. And I'm just following my pattern. I have two going in. That one looks like it's off size to me. And I always inspect and double check because sometimes when you're going really fast, you might miss something. And look, that one has just a sliver too much. And I could see that right away as soon as I laid it down. If your blocks are not exactly touching, then you go ahead and just take a sliver. So there's that. So I know that these two are going that direction. So I'm doing row one. This one goes in. This one goes down. And let me rotate this down so you could see more of things. So I'm gonna move this out of my way now. And so this is row. I want you to see the entire thing. So I'm gonna lay this like this. I'm gonna get an aqua and it's gonna go this way. Now I'm going to have a blue and it's going to go color side down. Then I have another blue. And it is going to go color side up. This one needs trimmed. So I'm going to cut my little guy using the traditional method of squaring him up on all four sides. So I've got that one and he's going color side this way to form my pinwheel. Then this guy is going this way, color side down. And then I have this little guy that I'm gonna trim really fast and I'm gonna lay him down. All right. All right, so once I form that little pinwheel in the middle and I start putting all of these little things all the way around that make the rest of this block, these look like two flying geese, so I'm gonna put those down on either side. I'm just building that block. This one's going this way. Get rid of those bunny ears. They really impact how you can swirl those seams. All right, one more bunny ear. I always keep a pair of scissors handy. I use scissors to trim things that I don't need. And then you're ready. Okay, so I always compare my block to my picture and then I lay the entire thing out. Your uh, wool cutting mat also works great as a design board. So if you have your wool mat and you lay it on there, you can take this wool mat over to your sewing machine and you can literally not have to move these so that you sew them together in the correct order because it's happened to me before i start picking up all my pieces i get over to the sewing machine and i think i have them in the right order the next thing you know i've sewn them upside down and i've got to get jack the ripper out and that makes me really sad one technique that prevents that from happening is called stringing your block and so that means that row one is going to go like this. You're going to put row two on top of row one. And so you're going to lay this just like this. And you're going to lay all of this row on tops, row two on top of row one. Then you're going to sew all the way down without stopping. So you're going to leave almost no thread in between, just a tiny bit. You're just going to sew a quarter of an inch all the way down. You're gonna take this one and you're gonna lay this, you're gonna lay four on top of three. 
and you're going to lay it just like this. And we're going to take that over there to the sewing machine. And then we're going to sew down this side. So you're going to have this one sew all the way down without breaking. And then this one all the way down without breaking. So I'm going to go over to my sewing machine and I'm going to go ahead and sew that up for you. So let me go ahead and pull this up. And I'm going to take this entire thing over here to my sewing machine and I'm not going to break my threads. And so that's why these little boards are helpful. So I'm just going to start. And I'm not going to stop. So I'm just going to go ahead and assembly line sew. And if you notice, these are bias edges on these pieces, so they're a little bit stretchy. So just take your time and slow, slow and steady, and you should be able to have super accurate pieces. So now that I have this piece and I know which one is the top, I'm going to go ahead and run my ender through there. And I have my little string, and I'm going to lay these just like this. I'm going to take my little string and I'm going to lay them facing the correct direction. So I'm going to lay them on my board facing up. And now I'm going to take my second row and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to sew it without stopping. do this particular technique called stringing because it ensures that you never get those pieces sewn in the wrong direction and that's my pet peeve is sewing them in the wrong direction so I have that so you should have two little guys that look like little flags so let me show you down here so let's see what you've got so you see these that look like little flags bring that down and so now I'm going to lay my pattern over here to my right and I'm going to open that to make sure that they're going in the correct direction and those are and that is and I'm making sure notice that's my seam allowance I'm going in the correct direction so now that these are all connected I know that I'm not going to flip these the wrong way so now I can take this and lay it right on top just like this flip 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 I'm going to lay it on top, I'm going to lay it on top, and I'm going to lay it on top. And so this makes, this ensures that these will get sewn going in the right direction. So now I can take this entire thing over to my sewing machine, and I can sew all the way down this row without breaking my thread. So without breaking a thread, I'm going to sew a quarter of an inch down all of this side, and then I'm going to come back. And I'm going to show you what happens next because next I press this. So let me go over here and sew really quick. And so I lift my whole thing, my big string, and now I'm going to run it through the sewing machine. And I don't pin because I've done this enough that I know exactly where my seam needs to land. And I've used the same sewing machine, so I know exactly how to make sure that all of my seams match. Consistency is key when you're quilting. You can, you can do a lot of things if you can just sew a consistent quarter inch seam. 
things that seem extremely complicated turn out just the way they should if you have that consistent quarter inch thing. And I don't know about you, but I really can't stand seam ripping. That's my least favorite thing of all the things that happen in quilting is seam ripping. It's my least favorite. All right. So this is a strung up block. Voila. So now my block looks like this. Looks like a bunch of little pieces, but guess what? This is what keeps me from turning all of those pieces in weird directions. So let me show you what happens next. So now that you have this and it's all connected, if you notice, this is just one big piece. Now I can lay, if you notice, I can lay this one on top of this one, right? And I can lay this one on top of this one and I'm gonna sew a quarter of an inch on these two opposite sides, these two opposite sides. Does anybody have any questions so far? All right. So if you have a favorite online quilt shop that you use to buy fabric, tell me what that is. Tell me what your favorite online quilt shop. And if you noticed, I haven't pressed anything yet. I haven't pressed a thing. So now I'm gonna go and I'm gonna sew on either side of this little pile of blocks. All right, let's keep sewing. When you get here, make sure that you nest your seams and that you feel that with your fingers so that you know that those seams are gonna be accurate. So make sure that you're nesting your seams. That means that your seams are going opposite each other. And that really helps to keep your blocks exact if you nest those seams. So it doesn't matter which way they go at this point because you haven't pressed anything. That's another advantage to this method is that you decide which way your seams go and then you press them together with your finger and then you run them through the machine and that makes them super accurate. So that when you open those, your points are very, very accurate. So I'm just gonna rotate this around, flip it around and I'm gonna sew it on the other side. Same thing, pushing those seams together, making, my, making sure my seams are nested. And that helps me to ensure that all of my blocks are gonna be super accurate because the key is accuracy and consistency. Feel that with your finger, push that down with your index finger, and make sure that your presser foot doesn't have too much pressure. And if you ever make a boo-boo, it doesn't matter. Your seam ripper can always help you. I noticed here that I veered off course just a little bit, so I'm going to go back in and just make sure that that is an exactly quarter inch seam. And then I'm going to come off and I'm good. So now I'm ready to go. So now that my entire block looks like this, it's sewn on two parts, it's still connected. Now I can take these parts, voila, fold it together, and I'm going to press this when I'm done. And that makes sure that none of my little pieces have gone astray or ended up in the wrong direction. I didn't iron first because I was trying to string my block. And when you string your block, it's better not to iron so that you can flip the seam whichever direction you want. And that's why I did not iron. And I'm going to show you guys in just a minute.
how we're going to do this. So now I'm going to take this. And I did not press because now I can push when I'm sewing each direction that I want. And those seams have not been pre-pressed. So I can just move them whichever way I want and it won't matter. So I can go like this. And I can feel those seams nest. Some people have to pin. I don't pin. So I'm in the non-pinning camp. And then I'm going to go ahead and sew this seam. And then I'm going to press the entire thing first after I'm done. After I'm done. So sometimes I press as I go, but sometimes I don't. And this is one time where, it, where it's better not to. Some people would probably think that that's a horrific practice. Um, I've been doing it this way, not pressing for 35 years and it works out. So I don't ever want you to feel like you have to be pressured to do things in a certain way. Figure out a way that works for you, that makes you consistent and accurate. And then there's a lot of reasons why people say rules are meant to be broken. So that's a rule that you can break. You don't always have to press every single step in between. Sometimes you do, some patterns require that, some patterns don't. Okay. Voila! Look at that. Consistency is key. Most of those points match really, really, really well. Voila! So now I'm going to press my whole block. And so now I'm going to press from the back. And so when I press this entire block, I'm going to press it from the back. So this is kind of puffy. And so I'm going to go back here and I'm going to flip these, uh, flip these seams so that they go where they want to lay. And then I'm going to make this block nice and flat. So I'm going to lay those seams down and I'm going to press this entire thing. So first from the back and then from the front. And I'm going to press them down on this side, and then I'm going to press from the other side, okay? By not using a bunch of starch, I save myself um, other headaches. Um, if your block does not turn out the way you want it and it's not perfect, like this one is a little bit wonky on this side, that means that I either had my presser foot too tight or maybe I was tugging on it a little bit. By not using a bunch of starch, it allows me to actually block Take my block and just tug on it just a hair. And if it's ever distorted, I can actually take my pins like this and I can take my block ever so slightly and tug it into shape. So you can take it and pin it like this where you want it. You can actually grow a block. If your block is too small, you can grow a block by a fourth of an inch or even a half an inch if your block is too small by not using a bunch of starch. And so I'm making it square with these pins and then I'm gonna tug it in the opposite direction. And as you can see, this one was off just a hair. I'm not gonna stress about that because finished is better than perfect in my world. And I'm gonna take and I'm gonna pull it over here. And I'm gonna tug it on the other side. And I'm going to use this wool mat to help me stretch my block to where I want it so that it's nice and square. This seam looks like it's off by a little bit. And I think that my sewing machine needs adjusted because sometimes your sewing machines can get off kilter. 
And so now that I have it like this, now I can just lay my iron on it and give it a little press and then I'm gonna give it a little trim. And that will ensure that my block lays nice and flat and nice and square. So this is just a different way of doing it. Now I'm gonna trim this block up. I have to make sure that it measures eight and a half inches before I proceed to my next step. So I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna use my big hair and I'm gonna make sure that that one measures eight and a half inches. So I just use a great big giant square and I'm gonna take and lay my eight and a half inch line. And if I do, this is pretty darn straight, not too bad. You can just sliver trim this just a hair on that side. This one corner is kind of wonky and I'm just gonna take and straighten it up. See how I got a lot of wiggle room? I'm gonna press that flat just a hair, but in, in the meantime, I'm gonna take and I'm gonna sliver trim this on this side. And I'm getting it good and straight. I'm gonna sliver trim it on this side. And now it's good and straight. And then I'm gonna sliver trim it on this side. And so now I can give it one final press to make sure that my block is good and square before I add. I'm using that 45 degree line, I always do. before I add my sashing. So I'm gonna take this thing, give it one last press to make it good and flat. I am not using steam at all. I'm just pressing it to death. There we go, good and flat. Now, I picked a sashing. I really like this pink. With mine, it looks kind of orangey on the screen. And I'm gonna cut two eight and a half inch pieces for the sides. So I cut that selvage. This is called Darlene's Favorites. It's what I've been using throughout most of it, but I've been supplementing with a little bit of Lori Holt. This is Darlene's favorite. So these are eight and a half inches. So I cut two of them. So I don't even unfold it at all. I cut from the selvage. And then on this side, I just take my scissor and I run my scissor inside there. And now I'm ready to add my sashing to this block. I just open it, cut it right at the fold and now my sashing is ready. I have two pieces, one for the top, one for the bottom. Then when I'm done, I will press these and I will add my two sashes to the side. Does anybody have any questions? You can ask me anything you want. You can iron whenever you want to iron. It depends on the pattern. For example, double wedding ring, I did not iron at all. This one, I did not iron at all. I literally made this entire top and never once ironed it. The only time I ironed it is when I, before I cut out my pieces. Now that it's done, because this has so much bias, I'm going to go ahead and press it using a little bit of, so I will spray sizing on it, and then I will press this before I uh, do free motion quilting on it. But some patterns, especially if you have a lot of bias, and this one does, the less you fiddle with it, the more accurate your pieces actually come out. The sashing is one jelly roll strip, right? You're doing eight and a half inches, so two pieces that are eight and a half, and then you're taking the remaining jelly roll strip and you're just cutting it at the seam because it should be just a little bit over 12 and a half. So you have two pieces that are 12 and a half and two pieces that are eight and a half of your sashing, okay? 
Now let's get our sashing sewn on. Let's see how this goes. All right, top and bottom. Move my wool mat out of the way. Flip it around. Do you guys ever lose things in your sewing room? That happens to me from time to time. I don't like that. It's like a black hole sometimes in my sewing room. I was like, I know I had that just a minute ago. And you don't have it. Eight and a half inches. It should match exactly on the top and the bottom. If you're a perfectionist, this can be a tough hobby because most of us that have been quilting for a while tend to be a little bit of a perfectionist. I can be really, really, really hard on myself and that is the hardest thing about being a quilter is that I want every piece to be perfect. And you know what? Every piece is not going to be perfect. Every now and again, you're gonna get a piece that's not perfect. But that one turned out just fine. Eight and a half inches. And then this one looks like it's going to be fine. I press towards the sashing. I press towards the sashing. And this one, for whatever reason, is causing me issues. And so I'm going to inspect it to see why. And I can see right away that at this end, I veered off just a hair. And so that can happen when you're sewing, especially at the end of a row. You can go, whoop, you can veer off into left field. Um, what can happen to the bulky seam at the pinwheel? And I'm going to show you guys in just a minute how to fix that. So I'm going to fix this really quick and I'm going to show you how to fix your bulky seam. All right, so now I'm gonna lay my two sashing bits, one across the top. They're gonna be longer and that's okay because you're gonna trim. So I'm gonna lay that sashing bit like that. I'm gonna lay this sashing bit here like that. I'm gonna smooth that, then I'm gonna go over to the sewing machine and get those sewn on. Then I'm gonna give it one more press and I'm gonna show you how to fix that bulky little seam in the middle of your pinwheel. I'm almost done. Whenever you're sewing a sashing, sew with the pieces facing up so that you can make sure that those go the correct way whenever you are sewing. So if you are sewing a sashing on, you're gonna wanna sew with the sashing piece underneath. And that's just to make sure that you're not chopping off any points and that your sashing is going to lay like it's supposed to lay. 
done ready for my final step okay so here we have this pinwheel in the middle and if you notice my seams are going in a circular fashion and this is how I normally sew anyway so I'm going to zoom down right here so you can see so this seam is now going in a circle and so to get rid of that bulk we're going to take that seam and we're going to pop another stitch out of there and we're gonna make it lay. So I'm gonna take my seam in the middle and I'm gonna break open this seam just a hair with my, uh, with my little point turner and I'm gonna flip fillet that open. And I normally don't open a seam, but to get rid of that bulk, I'm gonna fillet that open and I'm gonna send some of my fabric one direction and some of my fabric the other direction. And that's just to keep that seam from being so bulky in the middle. So I'm gonna tease it open with my fingers and I'm gonna make that seam lay flat. And so I will open that. There we go. I'm going to open that seam a little and I'm going to send half of my fabric to the left and half of my fabric to the right. I'm going to get in there and I'm going to smush it. If you notice, I opened that and now I'm going to smush it with my nail just like that. And in this instance, I will squirt it with water, just a hair, no heat, and then my finger. And what I've done is I've sent half the bulk to the left and half the bulk to the right, and I'm holding it right there. And then I'm just gonna give it a press. And what that does is it reduces the bulk right there at that intersection. And then you can just make that. So now when I feel that, I have smashed that open. And when I flip it to the other side and I give it a feel, it's not a great big giant hump. It's not a great big giant hump, right? And so that really helps. If you have never filleted a, a seam open, that really helps that seam to open up. All right, so now I'm gonna press towards my sashing like this. And in my corners, I'm gonna try not to distort my block. So I'm gonna just go over and hold. And then I'm just gonna block that along that stitch line. And I'm gonna come out when I press, I'm gonna come out towards the outside like this and I'm just gonna hold my iron because I'm not, I'm trying to make, no, I'm gonna try to make those not be wavy. And see how nice and crisp that is? That's what I like. And so here I'm gonna lay that like this and I'm gonna come in at, a, at an angle and I'm just gonna hold my iron just gently. I'm going to lay that iron right there, and, and I have these little ears that now I can trim off. Same thing. I'm trying to press my block to the outside, trying to press my block to the outside. And that reduces the amount of distortion that you get on your block. So I don't have a bunch of waves. I'm feeling pretty good about that. I'm going to check my seams. If people harass you about your crookedy seams, too bad, so sad. There you go. That is a block that I like now. So now I'm gonna take my entire block and I'm gonna take my big 12 and a half inch square and I'm gonna square her up to 12 and a half inches. So this is really, really close across. I just have a little bit to take across the top of here. So I'm gonna take and I'm gonna trim What's hanging off? Do you see what's hanging off on both ends? I'm just gonna take, this is really, really accurate on both sides. I'm just gonna sliver trim that. Goodbye, friend. Sliver trim that. Goodbye, friend. 
And then I'm going to rotate this one around. And I'm going to measure this way to make sure it is 12 and a half inches. And that is the only thing I have are those ends up here. And so I'm going to line this up to make sure that this is as close as I can to one of those lines so that it's good and square. If you'll put your weight in the middle, of, if you have like a, a little dumbbell, if you set it down in the middle of your thing, it makes it easier to keep it from wobbling. And now I have a completed summer sampler block. And that's a double pinwheel. And there's my block. And so that's block number three, friends. Block number three. And we are ready to continue. Does anybody have any questions before we sign off? Anything that you want to ask me? I really enjoy our Sunday night sewing sessions. Don't forget, next Sunday we have block four. On uh, at the end of the month, I will be in California. I have to visit my father. And so I will do a pre recorded release. So on Sunday night, you will get your video lesson, but I'm not going to be live because I'm going to be traveling. And that is um, on Sunday in a couple of weeks. But other than that, if you don't have any other questions, I will see you guys next Sunday. Air hugs and high fives, friends. You guys have a great Sunday night. Don't forget to change those clocks if you haven't done that. Have a great Sunday night. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.